I'm ready. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. So, hello, guys. And um, yeah, I've put some thoughts actually what would be the best to present today. And uh, well, I decided that best topic is probably something that you both find interesting for yourself, for the others, and something that you have experience with, because otherwise, how you can actually speak about that. So I picked the microservices architecture. I've been working with it for over two years uh, so far, and uh, I've already seen it's good and bad sides. And today we're going to discuss both. <laughs> Um, so let's go over our agenda for today's session real quickly. So we'll start about uh, what microservices is and uh, then uh, surprisingly it's anti-patterns. Yes, microservices has anti-patterns as well. Uh, then uh, we'll quickly jump back to the monolithic architecture and what's good and bad about that. Uh, then. Uh, basically the benefits and drawbacks of the, the microservice architecture itself, and gradually how we can go from the monolithic to the microservices by decomposition of it, the data management of the microservices, deployment patterns, because it has to live somewhere, uh, the communication style, reliability, because um, nobody likes when stuff stop working, <laughs> and uh, security, and observability. So I hope that you will find it real interesting for you and let's get started. So what is microservice architecture? Microservices which is like a short uh, name. It's also known as micro microservice architecture is basically a architectural style that structure an application as a collection of services. And uh, what uh, distinguishes it between the others, it's uh, the properties of those microservices. So what they are like, so they should be highly maintainable and testable. Uh, they should be loosely coupled. So it's uh, important because like, if you just divide your application on sub applications, uh, you might just end up with uh, more complexity that it was with the monolithic structure because you will have just small monoliths which wouldn't have uh, any point in it. So they should be loosely coupled. They should not have the connections that they're not supposed to have, stuff like that. Uh, they should be independently deployable. So uh, it would be best if uh, one deploying of one uh, microservice would not drag to deploy like three others because otherwise it's just bad. Uh, also, it should be organized around business capabilities. This is also very important. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slides. And well, the last that it should be owned by a small team. Well, this is not uh, absolutely required, but that is something that would be nice, uh, meaning that it shouldn't be uh, require a really big team to handle it. Like if it's a microservice, it should be something small. So these are the main characteristics of the microservices. Um, but I bet you already see that it's something really appealing to try and uh, implement on your projects. Well, I would say don't. <laughs> uh, well, I highly discourage using fancy technologies just for the sake of using them because they should bring benefit, otherwise it's just pointless. So before we even start talking about the usage of microservices, uh, let's go over main microservices anti-patterns. Uh, because if you're not aware of those, you can easily become a victim of one of those and all the great idea of uh, uh, microservice architecture can just go to vain because the, it will be ruined by some uh, simple, mistakes. So microservices anti-patterns. Uh, first is um, magic pixie dust. So believing that a sprinkle of microservices will solve all of your development problems. It will not. Uh, we need to understand what microservices are, what's, what they are intended for, and um, understand how it works and what we are trying to solve. Because if you have a lot of 
problems in your solution and you just think that, okay, maybe I will just try to go to microservices approach. No, that's not gonna work. That's not magic pixie dust. It's not solving all the problems that uh, development can have. So uh, just do not expect that. Okay, microservices as the goal. Making the adoption of the microservices the goal itself and measuring success in terms of the services written um, no, it's not the best. If you just keep dividing your application for smaller and smaller pieces without any point in it, you will just end up in an architecture that is really difficult to maintain because all these pieces have to communicate between each other, they have to have its own security, and then suddenly everything starts failing, the connections get broken, and it's all go to hell. So don't put microservices as the goal just to achieve the big number of it. Scattershot adoption. Multiple application development teams attempt to adopt the microservice architecture without any coordination and it starts getting really messy. Um, so ideally it's better to invest a little bit more but involve some expert or somebody who has experience with this approach and uh, uh, think over like the structure, how you want to handle it. So then it would be more structured because otherwise you can end up just with a really chaotic services which wouldn't bring benefits for anybody. So next is a little bit related, trying to fly before you can walk. Attempting to adapt the microservice architecture, as, which is advanced technique, without practicing basic software development techniques, such as clean code or good design or automated testing, like even for the monolith application, like what would you expect uh, to have in the microservice architecture? Nothing better will come of it. Uh, first, you need to have an order. You have to have the development team which follows these basic rules of clean code and good design. Uh, then like you might think of restructuring your whole application um, as, again, microservices, not the magic pixie dust. It's not solving just the regular clean code problems if you don't write clean code. Uh, focusing on technology. Focusing on technologies aspects of microservices, most commonly the deployment infrastructure and de neglecting key issues such as service decomposition is leading to not useful microservices. Because, um, well, it's really nice uh, that microservices would uh, start really quickly and they will be scalable, but uh, if it's not, uh, divided by business domains, then it will bring like little benefit to overall application. Uh, the next one is uh, the more the merrier. And imagine like that you already created this bunch of uh, microservices and surprisingly you have to then maintain all of them. And uh, it definitely doesn't worth it. So, in this intentionally creating very fine grain microservice architecture is not something that we would want to do. We need to really understand how many of those we need. And we will speak about this in the next slides. And the red fl flag law. So retaining the same development process and organization structure that were used when developing monolithic applications won't work for microservices. So if there was a big team and like we expect that everybody will still work on everything, that might not work. Uh, with the moving towards the new architecture, we have to understand that we would need to use new techniques and new development rules and do not be afraid to accommodate to it. So with all that being said, um, what's wrong with monolithic architecture then? Maybe we should just keep using it. Like there are so many precautions. What's the point? I guess you might be right if you ask <laughs> this question, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, monolithic architecture is good 
for the smaller project. It is simple to develop because everything is uh, on one uh, solution, for example. It's simple to deploy because you just deploy one application most of the times. Uh, however, when it becomes larger and larger, there can be very significant drawbacks of it. So the large monolithic code base intimidate developers. Of course, there might be everybody very senior in our in this video or very self-confident and they would say there is no such big solution that would intimidate me. Yes, opening the solution with 50 projects in it. Yeah, this is something that I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> I bet no. Uh, nobody likes uh, uh, working with such solutions. That comes to the second point that uh, our Visual Studio gets stuck in it uh, 10 times a day. No, definitely more. We hate it. It takes our time. Uh, you change something in one place, it may drag some other stuff that was related, that was poorly written. And that's just not good at all. Uh, not speaking even about the junior level developers or like just newcomers or the trainee level de developers, which just come and see this project and they are just shocked with it. So that is something that is really bad about the monolith architecture. Then uh, there is overloaded web container, uh, which means that uh, uh, it can require a lot of resources and you will never really know, well, you might uh, investigate this stuff, but mostly you will never know like which part of the application it's up all the resources that other parts potentially doesn't have enough resources for, uh, but uh, you wouldn't be able to do anything. You would just need to increasingly uh, increase the performance capacity of that server, just make it bigger or make multiple instances if that's possible, but you wouldn't solve the problem that probably you don't need uh, to have like only to have like this amount of uh, power for every part of your system, but only for that one. But you, since it's one monolithic application, you just cannot uh, divide it. Continuous deployment is difficult. Well, I bet that probably a lot of people face the situation where the release takes three months. And what is even better than that, that one month of those three months is regression testing. That is just nice. It's uh, I've been in such project that wasn't really that pleasant to deliver such a big um, monolithic application. Um, so it's kind of an obstacle of uh, quick and agile development. So this is a problem that would be nice to solve. Uh, scaling the application can be difficult. We a little bit covered this in the overloaded web container, so it's hard to scale it. It's when it's not uh, separated to the smaller ones. And the last but not least uh, requires long-term commitment to a technology stack. Old big applications are rarely changing their technologies since technology are evolving through time. Um, they are becoming old, nobody wants to work with it, nobody wants to support it, developers doesn't want to go to such projects, and everybody is sad. <laughs> okay, well, I guess we found out what's wrong with monolithic architecture. Now, what's good about the microservices? It's in contrary of what was said to the monolith, uh, microservices solves most of the mentioned issues, also, it, uh, well, as I said, enables the continuous delivery deployment of large complex applications because you don't need to deploy all at once. You can just deploy one microservice at a time if necessary. Each microservice is relatively small. Uh, working with the smaller applications is much nicer than with a big, huge one. 
improved fault isolation. Now imagine like these problems that I mentioned about the performance and now that microservices are all on the separate containers, they are all on the separate servers. Now you see that, for example, this and that part of your application doesn't really need that much of the resources. So you can scale down a little bit that, you can put less memory, less CPU, and for the others that is highly using the CPU and performance, you can scale them up and um, really give them enough power. And that is much better. Also, if there is some issue with application, like something uh, got broken, it doesn't mean that whole your application will goes down. It means that uh, if the architecture was right, you can just, one part will stop working obviously, but uh, like everything else will continue to be working and you will still have benefits of it. And uh, well, uh, the last, again, eliminates any long-term commitment to a technology stack. What's nice about the microservice, you can actually pick any technologies that you want as long as it makes sense. And they are usually communicating by uh, such uh, protocols like uh, that it doesn't really matter like which technology stands behind it as long as it sends the correct data. So that's nice. And it opens uh, a lot of possibilities for us as developers. Um, yeah, let's a little bit come back and see like what can be bad about those microservices because they are not that good. So developers must deal with the complexity of creating distributed system. So it all sounds nice that we would nice that we would have like a lot of microservices, but uh, well, if you really start working with this, you understand you have to create all of those. You have to create pipelines for deploying those. You have to have that code stored in the repository. You have to uh, maintain all this uh, observability, security, uh, communication between those services. This all will have to be taken into account. And uh, uh, that is something that uh, requires a lot of efforts at the beginning. So uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, deployment complexity. Well, it's not really complex when it's designed right, um, but definitely it should be kept in mind like that if we don't have like a backup uh, environment for the microservices, we have to think over what would happen if suddenly one of the microservices goes down during the deployment. Like, would it drag other microservices down or what would be uh, the impact? So might be complex if not sync through right. Increased memory consumption. Okay, this is confusing. In the previous slide, I was speaking that it actually can save us money like and we would potentially use memory more efficient with uh, this microservices and here i'm saying that it's increasing memory consumption well from one side yeah it's increasing it just depends on the benefits which we're gonna have like how much uh, it's increasing and depends where we want to host them but imagine that if uh, one monolithic architecture was sitting in one server and there was one operating system for it. Here we would have like 10 microservices and they sh all should live somewhere in the virtual machines or containers or whatever, but they all have operating system and operating system its own, its own resources. So like if it's too small, <laughs> then maybe there is no point of having it as a separate microservice. Like there is just, there should be sense in it. Uh, duplication of efforts. Uh, sometimes, and we honestly had this problem, maybe because of the lack of architecture or something, but imagine that you have microservices that have similar functionality, um, but for different um, companies, say, and um, you need to update something that is common for everybody. 
and let's say that it's not even like in code, all these microservices potentially might use same Nugget package, but you still have to upgrade the version of that Nugget package in each. Okay, potentially you don't have to upgrade just with new build, there will be grabbed a uh, new version of the Nugget package automatically. You still have to deploy all these microservices. So kind of duplication of efforts sometimes something that would be done once in, if it was a monolith. Harder to troubleshoot. This is the pickle. Not saying that with monolith and lacks of logs, it would be easier, but with the microservices and the network that we use to communicate, it might be even harder. Uh, when the request gets lost somewhere in the middle, well, nobody's happy about it. And if you don't have your logs uh, in one system, then it can be really difficult to troubleshoot that. Um, complexity of changes across all system. Well, this is something similar as uh, duplication of efforts. Uh, basically, if you need to change something across all systems, that is kind of more complex than in monolith. And communication say whatever but communication takes time energy and everything else like from us and if you if the microservices are handled by separate teams and you need to ask somebody from the other team and you just write an email and wait for that response uh, like three days considering that sprint has two weeks you will be just really disappointed in such kind of communication not saying that it should happen but it may happen and we just have to consider that. Okay, till this point, we weighed all pros and cons. And if you are still on this call, determined to try microservice architecture. In this case, let's see how we can go from monolith microservice to microservice architecture. So there is a saying, if service is bigger than you had, then it's probably too big. Well, meaning that just as I was saying, to not, do not divide your application into little monoliths. They should be divided with a purpose. So one of such possible ways how to divide the application is decomposed by business capabilities. So what business can do? And here just the easiest would be to go with the examples so for example, order management. This is something separate like business capabilities that just responsible for order management or customer management. And that would mean like uh, registering new customers, maybe updating their personal information, so everything like that, or maybe appointment management and stuff like that. Uh, then there is decomposed by subdomain. I guess everybody heard already such kind of pattern like domain driven design. And this is basically about it. Uh, why it's a little bit different uh, between the business capability. Subdomains is a, a little bit bigger concept. Like you need to pick a domain and it can have, it's like, it's not really functional, but it's more related to the business. And it can be divided uh, in such a way that then you can just split your application. So for example, one application would be purely responsible for uh, ordering from eBay and uh, the other application would be uh, responsible for ordering from some other company. Like they might be doing really the same stuff but uh, they are really uh, separate parts of the business. And if business suddenly decides to change it, like you would be able to change it. Then there is self-contained service. Uh, also kind of a way to think about the service. It's uh, if you create them in this way that when you Go, like send a request to some other microservice, you don't really need the response from it. You can proceed by your own. A good example of this can be, so you're registering for uh, some event or some 
I don't know, delivery. And all you get is the response here on your screen. Thank you for submitting your uh, application. We will get back to you in email. Uh, behind the scenes, microservices communicates something being processed, like uh, this request was sent to the delivery uh, microservice, and they are processing that. But we are not waiting for it. We already sent a reply. It's not always possible, but it's just easier because we are not dependent on that server. Well, unless those services just fails. Okay, then the service per team. Service per team, um, well, I guess that would only work like not just because you have three teams and all of those are new and you just divide like, okay, I will take this and you will take that. Now that is probably if you had those teams already and in a monolithic architecture, there is uh, always um, uh, such division because it's not really possible uh, for everybody to be responsible for everything. So potentially those teams already were responsible for some areas of those applications. So in that case, there is probably a point to look over those areas one more time. And maybe this is a good candidate for microservices. So going a little bit more technical, how we would really refactor our big monolith to the microservices. One of the potential approaches is strangling the monolith. What it means is like whenever new features, new requests comes, we propose to implement it as a microservice. Well, if it makes sense, then uh, also dragging a little bit of the monolith out of it and refactoring it as a microservice. Over the time in monolith, there is like outdated stuff some deprecated code that is being deleted and over time we are getting more and more microservices that's how potentially we can have nice and tidy microservice application now that's all good but if you're really working with the microservices we have to think about the data management uh, with all of the benefits of it, uh, like uh, we need to think about how the data will be potentially shared, especially when you need the data from uh, some other service, like uh, does the customer has enough money to do the purchase or something else like that. So there are a couple of options how to deal with this and let's discuss one by one. So, uh, like the most straightforward, probably the database per service. Uh, so usually with uh, doma uh, domain driven design, like uh, they recommend to have the separate database per service. So uh, you will keep uh, each microservices data private to that service and you will not allow to access the database by anyone else, just only by using that services APIs. Um, also like that database is part of that service implementation and that's basically it. Uh, it is nice because like you won't have any unexpected um, changes in that database. Uh, you can rely on it. And whenever something is necessary, other teams will just go with a request for you. So no unexpected things, no logs from unexpected service usages. And moreover, you can use any type of database that would suit that particular microservice. So for example, if you have a searching microservice, you would use Elasticsearch. Or if you need something that would have not structural data, maybe you would use uh, Azure clouds or something like that. So, and the best is no conflicts in the data usage, but there is always, but um, having a separate database for each microservice can be really overwhelming. It has to live somewhere. We have to manage multiple SQL servers and specifically if we decide to use a different databases then there will be a mix of SQL and NoSQL which is also confusing 
uh, we have to think about queries that will join data from the multiple databases because you will have the APIs to access them and you won't be able to use the regular joins. So it really depends what suits you best. The next option is shared database. Well, this is something very appealing. You just put there one database, everybody has access to it. Um, we can use our usual operations and seems to be everybody's happy about it, but uh, not that much. Um, the changes in one tables that was required for one service might break some other services which were dependent on it, if we were not aware about that. Like same as with application, the single database, if it's too big, it's much easier to crash it with some changes. Uh, then it's uh, obviously it's slower because there is a lot of dependencies and um, basically you can end up in the some locking with multiple services trying to access the same data and uh, you will just end up in the lock. Then there is a new pattern like relatively new pattern saga uh, which is basically meaning that each transaction, like each business request would be a sequence of local transactions and they will update the database, but they will also publish a message. So like it will be updated one by one and it will be like, okay, uh, order service, uh, it did local transaction then send message to the customer service. They did local transaction to the order service. Whenever something goes wrong and that service, for example, says that, no, it's all bad, then these local transactions are steadily reverted in all databases. So something like that. API composition. Also a possible way to have this API composer kind of a, like a facade for working with the data. So for example, you would be um, you would be querying just this API composer and it would just get you all data from all the services, everything what you need. Uh, good, you just call one service and it gives you everything what you need. Bad, some queries would be really inefficient and this will need to keep everything in the memory. Um, so Convenient, but not that efficient. Then there is a secure C policy, like uh, define a view database, which is read-only replica, and uh, that's designed only to support that queries. And um, they are basically uh, allowing you to use the database, uh, but not lock it and to use uh, the data without changing it. So you're uh, not going to have those problems. And uh, you can basically keep them up to date by subscribing to those domain events. But it has extra complexity. It potentially there will be code applications for this. And there can be replication lags, even though like if it's not like that fast. So uh, think carefully. Then event sourcing, that is also one I like. So basically whenever something happens to the entity, there is a event store so-called, might be a database where we store what's happened, like all the logs of the events and other services just subscribe to that table and they act on what was happened. Uh, the benefit of it is uh, that first of all, well, there is this audit log. So you already have it and you know what was done by whom and that's nice. The other benefit is that this kind of uh, things are mostly events and you won't have the relations to the real uh, objects. So you won't need to face that problem like uh, and uh, basically it also has some drawbacks as well because this is kind of different and unfamiliar style of programming. So there would be a learning curve 
and uh, well the event store is kind of difficult to query since it queries requires typical queries to reconstruct the state of the business entity and that is likely to be complex and inefficient and um, yeah in, as a result you would need to use um, security principles to implement the queries like the one that we discussed uh, on the previous slide okay uh, let's we we'll say we handled everything that related to the data management we decided where we would store and how we would use the data now where would our services live uh, kind of simple things like what why would we think about it but this is customers money particularly this slide it's a customer money like where would we uh, have those services lived uh, would it be multiple services per host yeah then uh, the customer won't need to pay for multiple servers nice uh, but kind of whole point of having them as a microservices might get lost because if that one server goes down, um, it drags everything down. Uh, we don't have that isolation when somebody, uh, one microservice is using extra resources. We cannot uh, like allow like other microservices to use as well that much of the resources. And uh, there might be some versions uh, conflicts in here. So kind of uh, we might say that it's save cost, save money, but also it doesn't really then serve the whole microservice purpose. Service instance per host. Nice. We just have a separate service uh, per host uh, and uh, everything is isolated but imagine the cost of having those hosts you would need to also maintain the operation systems you would need to maintain the security and uh, this is kind of really overwhelming um what we can do with this well this is 21st century we can put them in the virtual machines like we've been using them for a while now so that's not problem and then we can uh, foot of how many resources each service would use but they are not that flexible uh, still uh, but much more flexible than this option that's for sure uh, we should still care about the operation systems we should still care about the security and all the infrastructure in all is all on us uh, however it's just a little bit lighter so that's a good thing service instance per container uh, everybody heard about the docker microservices is something that works really well with it so this one uh, would give us like it would be much faster to uh, bring up new instances of those uh, to work with those so uh, really nice way but it requires a learning curve as well because we have to have experience with this and how to do this um yeah i guess everything else is pretty good about it serverless deployment might be even better we are actually starting with the serverless deployment these days and so just learning of the benefits and drawbacks of it so just a few examples um, Amazon Lambda functions, Google Cloud functions, Azure functions. This all is serverless deployment. And it works really well if your microservice is really small. If it starts quickly, it just worth it having serverless. You don't need to care about the environment maintenance. You don't need to care about uh, the amount of those containers. You can have those automatically if it's in cloud. Um, that's all nice that's all really quickly you just you just don't need to care about the infrastructure almost at all uh, you just use it but as i said this is really suitable mostly for small applications if it's a microservice that uh, is quite big that for example responsible for whole domain and it takes some time to start it uh, then it might be not that good because um these functions they may go sleep 
like if you don't use them because you're paying only for the requests. And whenever a new request comes, uh, for example, Azure will just give you a new instance of it. And if it's starting slowly, then there might be just a huge delay for that. So this is for some light functionality and then you won't need to spend that much time of the infrastructure. Uh, so pick yours. Communication style. Well, those microservices, how to communicate between each other somehow. The most popular is RPI, uh, which is usually REST. And that is something that we are all familiar with, that we've been using for a really long time. And um, well, good, nice. Bad thing is that, well, if the other service is down, we will just get um, that it's down and that's it. Um, other option, messaging. We can use really different kind of cues for this communication, which is also awesome because it allows us to handle the traffic. And if the servers go down, we can have uh, some kind of queue implemented there, and um, then uh, those messages won't be lost. They will be eventually processed, so kind of nice option. Uh, there can be domain-specific protocols. Well, this is if you really need it for your uh, specific application. From what I know, like there protocols could be something like SMTP but like that's probably like for some really specific uh, needs. Then, you know, like that would be all really awesome, like uh, with microservices and actually with other microservices, if it wasn't failing once in a while. So unfortunately, we have to think about the possible failures and how we can actually uh, prevent them from happening or like react uh, properly for those. So. Google's site reliability team has found that roughly 70% of the outages are caused by changes in a live system. And yeah, I totally agree because usually uh, the errors comes after the release and the releases are rolled back. So with microservices, it is possible to configure automatic rollouts. So whenever the after release something bad is happening, uh, we just it will be just rolled out to the previous successful version. Yay! Finally. Um, uh, then self healing. Uh, really nice. Imagine something happened and your microservice is uh, real processing really performance intensive operation and suddenly it needs more memory than you expected. So there is a possibility to configure this self healing. So it will just for that period gives it more memory or uh, for example, it just stuck with something. So it will automatically do the a pull recycle for it. So that's kind of nice. That's automatic. We don't need to care about that. However, it needs to be used with cautious because there can be a situation uh, when the starting of the microservice takes really some time. And while it's still starting, it's not warmed up yet. Uh, it's still considered that it's too slow, it's unresponsive, and it just starts the recycle again. And you go to the infinite loop and you just stuck here. So self-healing is nice, but configure it wisely because it might bring more problems sometimes than benefits. Failover caching. Failover caches, like it's when you have caching for uh, the data that the other microservice would return you. Uh, so there would be potentially two different expiration dates, a shorter one that would tell you how long you can use that cache in the normal situation and a longer one that uh, would uh, work if potentially that other microservice just failed. So in that case, uh, you would use that cache, but that works only in the situation when some data is better than no data. I don't think that the banking system would be a good example for the usage. Um, then the retry logic. 
obviously a network can be slow, there can be some issues, and we have to think about the retry logic from our microservices. However, here we also have to think that uh, we shouldn't do the 10 retry in one second after the first attempt fails. Uh, the good practice is that uh, the, the first attempt would be immediate. Uh, for example, the next one would be in three seconds. The next one would be in uh, nine seconds. The next one would be in 20 seconds. So it's like uh, the periods between the retries are getting bigger and bigger. And obviously there is some limit, like 10 retries in total. So in that case, we would see like if it's a network problem or not, then potentially it might get auto resolved. Otherwise it can load the system even more than it is. Uh, then rate limiters and load shaders. Uh, so for example, we have a really big traffic for some reason, there was an email campaign or something and um, suddenly there is a huge number of requests, but we know that our microservice can handle only this amount of requests. So we put kind of a load shader and we put those in the messaging queue, for example, and it's just will get as much request as it can process and everything else would be suspended and when the traffic will go normal again then everything will be steadily processed this is kind of useful um, might be done by the message queues or something like that that's pretty cool file fast and independently what it mean? Um, for example, we have uh, five microservices in a chain and the last one is failing. And if we keep like sending requests from the first one to the last one, even though the microservices in the middle might be used for some other operations, then we just keep loading the system for all these retries with no good reason because the last server just fail and it's just down and there is no good about it. So in that case, uh, it's better to send uh, like notification or something like that, that just stop and do not uh, load the whole system because other potential functionality might be still uh, working normally while that particular server is down. Security. I guess there is no surprise for everybody that security is really important these days. When we dividing the monolith architecture for the smaller application, we have to understand that we are basically revealing those uh, like even more points where we can be attacked. Uh, there can be requests if these microservices are accessible from the public network, there can be requests from there. We have to somehow distinguish if it was our request or maybe somebody else is just attacking us. So this is a huge topic here. I would just emphasize that one of the potential way to deal with it is to uh, have the authentication token that would be used between the microservices. That way they would understand that this is part of our system and everything else would be just abandoned. Uh, right away. Obviously, there is like really much more to discover here. Then observability. I could really going on to the end already. So, but this is really important. Um, so we pushed our system live and it's performing really well, but suddenly something goes wrong and some kind of requests are getting lost in the middle. And now imagine that logs from each application is stored separately. So you have to combine them, you have to compare the times, you have to go and look to each of them. This is really overwhelming. The idea is to have the centralized logging service that would aggregate all logs from each service and well, well basically do this stupid work for you. Then the application metrics. Uh, we need to gather statistic about the individual operations and uh, the metrics uh, 
uh, themselves, like uh, how good it's performant and uh, the best would be if it's done automatically and if it's somehow uh, controlled in the dashboards. So we see like if that's loaded okay or not, or maybe we should do something about it. Then audit logging. Uh, we need to understand the behavior and troubleshoot the problems of those. So uh, we need to see like what was done by which microservice. So we see like, okay, that microservice went to the database and dropped that user, for example. Uh, distributed tracing. Uh, so basically uh, it's about uh, tracing of the, uh, errors that are happening and uh, the, the behavior of an application, troubleshooting those problems and um, also attaching the ID for the request so we can uh, see the whole track of the request from the one microservice to the last one and we can see where actually it got lost because this is uh, really convenient and um, there can be many properties used for that, but the best is just to have the unique ID for each request. And that's why if we have log aggregation, we can just look through it and that's just really awesome. Exception tracking, well, same as in Monolith, we need to track the exceptions. We might even configure some automatic um, actions when such exception goes to the logs with the cloud development, that might be nice. Uh, health check APIs. We need to be sure that our microservices are up and running and they are healthy. And if they are not automatically uh, handled by some cloud systems like Azure, like so it won't roll out a new instance in case one fail, we need to have those health check APIs which would, which would give us the idea if it's up and running and the notifications if it's down and not running. <laughs> okay. Uh, log deployments and changes. As I was saying, uh, usually the changes that we deploy breaks the microservices. So we really need to have like the log of all the deployments and changes that were done. For inspiration, um, which companies is actually using microservices? Really big number of companies and actually a big one using microservices. Uh, Netflix, Amazon, eBay, Netflix, rumor has it that it is responsible for 30% of the internet traffic, but, and it's using microservices and it's using it successfully. Other, like, yes, they succeeded, they used it and they are using it good. So why don't you? Want to know more, like check out these links. A lot of information for this presentation were taken from them, but there are really much more to discover. So I encourage you to go further. You may also try it out uh, on your applications if it makes sense. So I hope that it would be useful. And the final thought for this presentation, when you are just starting to develop microservices, Start modestly with just one or two services, learn from them, and with time and experience, add more. I wish you all the best success you, as you're exploring fascinated microservice architecture. Thank you for watching. Maybe someone have questions? Thanks for motivation motivating presentation only question is uh from the slide uh, what is microservices and from this slide we currently seen i still don't get the difference between service oriented and microservice oriented architecture yeah this is actually a very popular question and i was confused actually as well like at the beginning like but what's the difference like there are same benefits same pro like same pros same, same cons um, yeah, the difference is basically only about the size. <laughs> so uh, service architecture is um, more about um, a really huge enterprise applications. 
and microservices are meant as an architecture that this is about you can have like even small application that would consist of 